He started off as a singing duo with his brother, wowing cabaret audiences all over the country. Then he turned director and directed some of the top cabaret artists in one woman, mostly one woman shows about famous women. Then he started writing. He not only directed this year's The White Rose, but he's now also got a new show that he's also wrote and directed, Figueroa. We're talking Will Nunziata. Will, tell me first about The White Rose. How did you get involved with that and what's happening with it? Because things are happening with this show. It is. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. Um, White Rose the Musical came about two years ago when I was asked to come in to kind of audition as a director, basically meet the team. And the subject matter was something I was very interested in, mainly because I had never heard of the White Rose. Neither had I until I saw this. It's unbelievable. They are so well known in Europe. They are heroes in Germany. They have buildings and streets named after them. Yet when I read the script, I always go to the script first. Musical, play, film, TV, I always go to the script. And what Brian had done, ha he, he, he took obviously some creative liberty because you can't put everything you want into the theater piece version of the story. But I was so flabbergasted that the timeliness of it. Here you had German university students speaking out against the lies of Hitler. And they weren't Jewish. They were not Jewish. And they spoke out when they felt something was wrong. And I thought, huh, I also like to say yes to things that I feel like I could be challenged and learn something. And as you know, as, uh, as a performer turned you know, director, I also tend to usually direct things that I also have a hand in the writing. So I knew it would be a challenge to not be the writer. Mm. But as the director, which I think is kind of like the ultimate editor, Brian Belding, the show's creator, writer, and Natalie Bryce, the composer, the three of us really became a team. And it was a best idea wins room. And I'm excited that we are finishing up our beautiful run March 31st. We have a world premiere recording coming out and perhaps some, an eye on, let's just say, a little London town. <laughs> um, I agree with you. That show was incredibly timely. And I wish that we as human beings would step outside of ourselves. I mean, you've got an enemy of the people right now, which is pretty much one man doing the same thing. We don't do that in America anymore, I don't think. We don't. We don't. And if there's anything that I've learned from the experience in watching audiences come out of White Rose, mm -hmm. to see Jewish community centers taking buses to see the show, students coming with their teachers to see shows, Holocaust survivors bringing their grandkids. Wait, they're still there. Uh -huh. I thought there wasn't a whole lot left. Last night we did a talk back. At, really? Uh huh. With Holocaust survivors who knew the White Rose. Oh, it, Susanna, it was it was such a reminder that, and we've talked openly about, and oh, maybe yeah. not a conversation here, but what it was so beautiful about. No, we can art, talk about this. I talk about controversial things here. You I'm going to get into it in a minute. But look at. What I love about White Rose is that whether you are blue or red, whether you believe in X or Y, the biggest thing that I have loved about White Rose is that it has started conversations. It has started conversations that may be tough. No, we need to have these conversations. So I, I, that's been probably for me um, the like, proudest thing. Don't you wonder why we're not having these conversations? Why is it in a country where we're allowed freedom of speech, are we suddenly not allowed to speak? I know. I mean, I'd be the first person that people would say, oh, no, she's going to talk about it. Because I am. I, I think it's insane that we're not. I, I think it's insane that we're not talking about the Palestinian-Israeli crisis. We should be talking about this. And I think off, off of that, you know, any time that we've had, I think, solution-based messaging, 
is when sides came together and found the humanity, yeah. the common ground of humanity. So that's what the White Rose experience has been. It's been a beautiful experience in working with artists in finding the humanity of what art can do. Whether people like the show or not, what they have loved is the fact that the message, the messaging. So it's it's been a really it's been a really beautiful experience. No, I I agree. I mean, I seriously wish we talked more. I really do, and I wish we could talk without being condemned for having a difference of opinion. That's right. I and agree. We should not be. I agree, and thank God we have art. Thank God. You know, that's something. There's something timely, and timeless, about art. Again, we can go to a museum. Someone can look at a Van Gogh and see something that maybe someone else doesn't. But at the end of the day, if we just have more of an opportunity to just realize we can all look at something and see something different, mm -hmm. but let us be in a space of common ground, of, wow, someone created something where there was nothing before. That takes guts. And so... Um, Finishing the hat. <laughs> We can have a Sondheim show me and you. I know. We but really the, you say that and all I can think of is, look, I made a hat <laughs> where there never was a hat. Well, I think that's a good segue, Susanna. I mean, you mentioned Figaro, an original musical. Yes. It was a musical that was built during the pandemic, obviously the darkest time in, 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 in many people's lives. And uh, I met beautiful Ashley Jana, who is an incredible, incredible composer. I heard her songs on Instagram, and I messaged her. It was April of 2020, a few weeks indoors. I'm like, you know what, Will? You like this girl's music. Just, just go for it. What are you going to do? Walk outside? Can't do that. <laughs> I messaged her, and I said, Ashley, these pop songs that I'm listening to, I know I might sound crazy. I've been called worse. They're like little playlets. Have you ever thought about writing a musical? And she said, Will, first off, nice to meet you. Secondly, that's been my goal since I was a little girl. And I wrote back right away and I said, let's do it. Wow. So over two years, two years, we would talk, talk story. She'd go off, write one or two songs, come back, show and tell. And we co-wrote the book and the story for this original piece, nothing to do with the opera. The name Figaro came out of, like, we didn't even think about How it. are you combating the fact? Because I thought it was that. It's been, look at, we have producers now who are going to be taking this to the West End of London, which I'm so excited. I'll, of course, give you an exclusive when I can Thank officially you. announce it. Thank You've you. You've been such a big supporter of mine throughout all the years. Oh, because I like what you do. I know, but it means and a I lot. And I think I've known you since, like, what's your first cabaret at Feinstein's? Uh -huh, at the Lowe's. Yeah, I was there. I know. <laughs> I know, and I look at, I had this beautiful career with Anthony. We created something out of nothing. And after we headlined Carnegie Hall with the New York Pops. I was there for that. Oh, God bless. And <laughs> you in the shoes. <laughs> oh, my red shoes, my ruby reds. Uh -huh. It was something about thanking my parents and teachers mm. that I said, I now want to give other people their downstage center Carnegie moment. And I had that sentiment. Aww. I know that sounds woo-woo, but no. it's really how I think. I don't think so. You know me well but enough. But you know to, I'm like that anyway. So. I know. But you know me well enough I that do. that's actually my heart. And so when I heard Ashley's songs on Instagram, I said, let's create something together. The name Figaro came out of, we were playing, we were playing almost like tossing the ball. We we're like, what's the most flamboyant, sh like showman type of name that we can think of? And both of us at the same time, we said Figaro. Zorro. <laughs> In that. But to answer your question, we have these producers who are taking this to the West End. Mm -hmm. Most of them like it because for them, because I have some noise about it because it's look at, people are going to get confused, yes, but what I'm reminded by a lot of these producers who took it on were, you know what, it's a known IP. People will be at least curious. I think you should add into that show Go. a couple of moments where you hear, Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. Because then you're like kind of playing tongue in cheek off of it, but you're also giving them that one little moment of Figaro, which is Wait. what they do know. Look at it. We're eavesdropping in on a best idea wins room 
right now. This is how I work. Hmm. I like that because our star Sienna, so it's basically about this 19 year old singer Sienna who feels isolated on her father's farm in um, 1800s Italy. And she has a, she just has a chance meeting with these two kids on the streets of Italy who learn about Sienna's story. And Sienna says, uh, when the kids ask, what do you want to really be? She goes, I just want to be a singer. And they go, we perform in Figaro's traveling show. We're in town. Come meet them. And that's when the journey takes off. And Ashley and I have really created what we like to call um, like a romantic thriller mystery. Her music is stellar. I mean, her music, it's um, a lot of the... What's it like? Like if you had to compare it to compose? I would say, I would say it's... What Andrew Lloyd Webber did with Phantom of the Opera mm. meets what Pasek and Paul did with Greatest Showman. Oh, okay. With a touch of a Tim Burton sensibility. Oh. Everything's a little dissonant. Everything, it seems too good to be true. And then there's like a little skew in everything. And That's um, life. There it is. There it is. And off of I'm in a Best Idea wins, wins you, there's actually a moment in the show where our singer Sienna, you learn that she has some, um, how do I say this? She has some um, issues mentally and psychologically. And it don't we all? Don't we all? And also, this was written during the pandemic. So we really leaned into it. And um, there is a moment, though, like a music box moment, mm -hmm. that I am curious if we could add just like almost like an Easter egg. Yeah, that's what I mean. So that then people who say, well, it's not Figaro, the opera, and then we can maybe as writers that, be like, but how do you know? Maybe it was inspired. Exactly. Us, yeah. But do you get a that percentage? way you're helping. No, that's okay. Um, you're using two of my favorite people in this. I love Binge Pasek. I think that boy is a star waiting to be a superstar. Do you want to hear how I got him? Yeah, how'd you Talk get Talk about this business. You never know. My brother and I, we sang, you know, as kids. We did jingles. Right. My agent was Barry Colker. Oh, okay. When I found out Benjamin, I was like, oh my God, it's my friend Barry. You know, it's like Uncle Barry. I sent the materials to um, Barry, who sent it to Benjamin and his beautiful mom. And uh, they were in, and I'm like, oh, he was in? And then I said, try to do like good business. I'm like, you know what, Barry? There's a girl in it. I want to use someone from your roster. Oh, nice. And then he sent me a bunch and they're all beautiful but Lily Bell Morgan what a star and the two of them together magic yeah I just think that boy He's smart did you see him at the uh, York Theater oh amazing. it was brilliant and Thomas Oliver I did and, and even as Winthrop I, I I wrote about him as Winthrop I personally think he stole he the show have, I think he should have been nominated oh I for agree for best featured actor in a musical I, but it, that would not have been good for him so I'm glad they didn't actually. Why do you He's say too that? young. Oh, I hear what you mean. I and hear you. then it would have to be like, but if you ever talk, do you know what that guy, what that little boy's role is? That the one he wants to do? What? Sweeney and Sweeney Todd. Oh my God! I know. He's such. He is. I mean, I could cry thinking about all those beautiful talents that said yes. Um, but you also on. have Maurizio, who I love. Maurizio Martinez. I've known him since I started my paper because. Jaime Lozamo was one of the first person, people, to uh, take out an ad in my paper and oh help me do it. It was Children of Salt. Oh my gosh. And Maurizio was the lead. Maurizio is um, one of my best friends. There was no one else, no one else that I wanted for this role. Maurizio can play the bad guy, but his countenance the moment he walks on the stage, you root for him. Exactly. And it's hard when you have a villain in our story, quote unquote, also be human, because that's all Ashley and I wanted with this character of Figaro, is that, yes, maybe he can be archetyped as the villain, mm -hmm. but what makes a villain? We're all humans. We were all young once. We all have our own traumas and lead with it. Uh, I think the answer to that is the choices that you make knowing right and wrong. There it is. Yes. And, I mean, to quote another son, the road he didn't take. Oh, hardly comes to mind, does it? Oh, that was on key too. Of course it, it was.
Um, <laughs> I but, love that show. It's a great show. That's, well, I want to mention Sondheim too. Yeah, sure. Ashley is, um, she's so singular in her talent. And I'm so excited that our album is out on Center Stage Records because of the amazing, my dear friend Van Dean and Robbie Rizal. Good people. They are kind, good people. Good people in this business. And they care about promoting this business, which could easily die be considering what people are doing to it. Well, you too, Susan. And you too, Magda. You have real people of the planet who support artists and give them a platform. Because they all deserve it. You're very, I mean, that would be great that if we had more people like you, like Van, like Magda. I mean, it's, um, I mean, call me old school, but, you know, you used to have shows, you know, the, 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 the I mean, my grandfather, Bill Wendell, was David Letterman's announcer in the 80s and 90s, but he also was the announcer oh, for cool. Ernie Kovacs. And, mm. and I remember watching, you know, old clips of these shows, and you would have Broadway stars on oh. these, you know, a mainstream shows. And so I love seeing that that's kind of coming back with the Lynn Wells of the world yes. and a lot of these um, Broadway people that are also in TV film. I don't know, that was a spiral. But no, that's so funny because did you ever play the game when you were a little kid that you got three wishes and then you decided what the wishes were? No. Oh, Which, okay. Can we play? So, yeah. Um, but my one wish yeah. was always to be like Mike Douglas and have my own talk show and TV show and then sing with my guests and choose what I got to sing. Yeah. And yeah that's so here we are. And here I am. Wait, here we are. I know. At the Lambs Club. <laughs> Talking. Yeah, we're kind of singing too. So. Here we are. <laughs> this is your variety show. Yes, it is. But that's what I, oh, like I so wanted great. to do musical theater. Yeah. I, like, yeah. totally wanted to do that. But yeah, that was really what I wanted. I wanted I wanted to choose who I got to sing with, who I got to perform with, what I got to sing, because a lot of times, you know, I grew up on, in the era of uh, the Diana Shore show, sure. the Mike Douglas show, the um, Ed Sullivan show was a little before my time, but I watched reruns. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to do that. Variety. Yeah, because I thought they weren't done well. Oh yeah, Sonny and Cher. Well, what I love too about what you're saying, Suzanne, it doesn't it doesn't um, surprise me that you had an inkling for that because mm. I think you have a deep curiosity. I do. I, I mean, I care more about what's going on than most people do, and I'm not afraid to state my opinion, even though <laughs> I'm waiting for the day that it cancels me out because. I, I I don't know how to be afraid of it. Well, look at... I mean, I know a little bit about how to be afraid of it, but yeah. like the guy in Enemy of the People, yeah. no, I'd rather say the emperor has no clothes, no. Right. Well, look at... I mean, some of what we speak about in, you know, White Rose is the, is the power of the truth. Yeah. And, you know, like you said about having First Amendment rights in this country to speak for free speech. Um, no, I'm telling you, if I lived in the age of the White Rose, I would definitely be one of those kids. And I would know my time was limited. But I, I, I am also not a person that thinks this is the only life I get. And I also look at this lifetime as not the best place to be. I mean, I think we're horrible to each other. I, I think that we're so me, me, me. And I'm like, oh. Well, I mean, to go back to you know, when we're talking about something that you've always felt you wanted to do, granted you love musical theater, yeah. but you felt that there was something a part of you that wanted to also give space for other people. It's how yes. I felt as a performer. I mean, yeah. look at, I had a beautiful career with Anthony. My brother, I'm so proud of him, singer, songwriter, traveling all over. Um, for me... And uh, that's like a no-brainer. Like, you really, your brain just has to think about music and you're like, yeah, good. Okay. And for some, for most people, when they said, wait, Will, you want to be a director? It just was always in my... DNA. In my DNA, you know, I saw. No, I'm dating myself. I saw. <laughs> I saw how. I think I already did. Oh please, you're a kid to me. My soul's oh, ninety. Um, I'm at the Lambs Club, and I'm like feeling the ghosts of people. I'm like, hey, hey, friends, um, Irving Berlin. <laughs> um, 
I saw Hal Prince's revival of Showboat at mm. the Gershwin. And although I didn't know what That's it, when I first came to New York. Stop it. That's right. And did you see that revival? I also auditioned for it. No. I was told I was too young. Mm -hmm. Wow. I was also told they couldn't put me into the chorus because I would take away. Because you have star quality. No, uh, I, no. Even when I did summer stock, like, and I and I played a small role. You said no. They would it single me out. Like I didn't know what I did. I was like, you have it. I wasn't trying. Well, that's what it is. I saw the revival. You weren't in it. No. But maybe my revival. Aww. We'll talk. But I remember watching it from the mezzanine, and I was with my twin brother. My, my parents, my sister was too young at the time. And while you know, I was watching everyone in the audience either humming to the songs or clapping at, I was watching how the sound design, lighting design, costume design, set pieces, people, orchestration were weaving a quilt. I mean, I literally described it to my mom and dad afterwards and they were like, Will, are you, what? <laughs> And I'm like, no, but everyone was dancing with one another and we're part of the same narrative. And in the way that, you know, in Old Man River, he went from downstage left and he hook turned up. I don't even know oh, what yeah, I, you were definitely a director. I don't know what a hook turn was. And I'm like, yeah, he did that little hook turn thing in the way that the set, and it was this epic socioeconomic, and it was going to like these intimate moments. And then Elaine Stritch with the baby, it was a reprise from knew the history. Long and short, it wasn't until college, at Boston College, when um, I took directing classes that, that I was like, Oh, speaking the language of a director yeah. I didn't even know. And I just love artists. And like what you said too, like when you said that you would watch these variety shows. And yeah. I want to, my, my favorite feeling is holding court for others. Mm. Holding court for others to be the best version of themselves. And to do it in White Rose with these writers, to, to be a co-writer with Ashley of this book, and I will be directing it in West End, is... Um, creating something, you know, to hopefully entertain and inspire. I am so glad I know you because that is how we all should be. Um, building each other up, wanting the best for each other, wanting the best for humanity, to give. Like the whole reason I ever wanted to do theater was I love the idea that no matter where the audience was in their day, yeah. I had the ability to change that. I had the ability to take them out. I had the ability to make them experience feelings That's that right. maybe they couldn't. Yes. I, I, that was the whole reason I loved doing it, was that I loved the idea that I could give this. But look at what you're doing now. You're providing a platform here. Mm -hmm. You go to shows, you review them, you're on but committees. I, I also make sure as much as possible that I do a he says, she says. Like that's one of the things I pride myself on because we don't see shows the same way. That's right. A show I can love or hate. Somebody else may love. That's and right. I don't want to take that away from the show. I mean, I come from a background of performance. I come from a background of seeing shows since I was Yeah. Yay big. Listening to shows since I was yay big. So my reviewing sense comes from also a performer sense. Mm. And when, like when you were directing, yeah. going to see, when I, before I became a reviewer, yeah, no, I didn't break anything down. But now when I go to see a show as a reviewer, it's like playing Hollywood Squares. Mm. Are all these boxes ticking the mm. mark? And when the lines between the boxes blur and it becomes one cohesive piece, mm. I'm in seventh heaven. Yeah. But when it doesn't, it, it's almost like I want to hide my head in the sand because I don't want to really write. But, you know, it's a joke because if I love a show and I give it a rave review, it gets less looks at if I... Don't like a show we'll and say our, why? Well, look at our world. We love. I know, but that's so weird. But also, you know, Susanna, I want to give you know you some grace in that. Thank goodness we have people like you who can speak their unapologetic truth. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you've always been respectful. You've always been right. respectful that even if in a show don't tell way, 
Right. If you really look at your reviews, that maybe even shows that you don't like, what I love is that it makes sense that you have that sensitivity as a performer. Oh, good. Because, well, you're also probably thinking, I have to speak my truth, but you also probably know people are going to read it. Well, it also has to do with, if I sent a person to a show and it was their first time going and it was not a good show and they went to see the show because of what I wrote, I feel guilty. My, you know, theater, sadly enough, is so expensive. Yes. That I agree with you. I, I'm afraid to send a first time person to a show that I don't love. And I try to give them the reasons I do and the reasons I don't. Like, I try. I, I, I really do. Yeah. Um, and I feel bad when I don't love the show. I really actually do. Right, because you're rooting. Like, it, like any, like, oh, it, it also reminds me of the way that you're talking, like a casting director. Mm. It's true. As a director, I actually want everyone who comes in the room, I want to cast them. It'll make my job easier. Oh, you know what I mean? Exactly. Well, same with you, right? Yes. Let, let, let the love of it write the review itself. But this is the thing. You know, we live in a society today that has become very careful. That, you know, that can be l beloved by some, hated by others, but... At least you got an emotion out of them. Amen. You know, Amen. I, I think it's when the shows are, eh, that I feel the worst. Yeah. Because yeah, you're, you're, not, you're not getting anything from There's me. no engagement. You're bored. Yes, I well, am. Well, that's the worst, to be bored. You know what I mean? And I've been bored. Amen. And, you know, so have I at shows. Um, but, um, so, I mean, look at I'm, uh, overall, the experience with White Rose has been so beautiful, more than anything, and you mentioned this word and you're right, mm. the message of it yeah. is timely and universal. I love the message of it. I, I Seriously, I, I went home after seeing the show and did like two and a half hours of research mm -hmm. because I wanted to know more. I, I wanted to know how did they live, how did they die, who were they? I wanted to know everything because I found them so heroic. Amen. Amen. And with Figaro, an original musical, I'm excited um, for the world to meet Ashley Jana as a composer and a lyricist. She when do we get to see it here? Such a great question. Thank you. We're going to be going to London the beginning of 2025. Why so long? There's there's some there's some exciting development. Oh, cool. That we want to do it right. Okay. And also the venue and the people um, that we're working it's with. It's important the venue of what you do things in. Sometimes it's too big. Sometimes it's too small. It really is. People don't think that's important, but it is. It is. And so we want to do it right. For what the, I'm all about what's the assignment. Yeah. For Figaro and Original Musical, it's a very specific assignment of a show. We need a very specific theater. I know beggars can't be choosers, but we have a beautiful general management team in Carter Dixon McGill over in the West End. They've, do, they've done Death Note. They're doing that beautiful Pippin concert with Oh, Death Note. Jenna Robbins is on that. Yep. And Haley Swindoll, yeah. a beautiful friend. Um, and uh, they, they, they were the producers and GMs of that. And um, yeah, no, we have a great team. I've heard great things about that show, actually. Me too. Me too. Um, and so um, we have uh, Michael Lehman, our lead producer. We have Van Dean, executive producer. Oh, yay. Van um, came on board? Okay, that's great. I know. That means he cares. Well, and you know Van. He's got I great do. taste. And Van? Doesn't say yes to everything. No. As a matter of fact, very little. He's been, Van Dean, he's become not only such an amazing collaborator, but an amazing friend. And um, I love his taste. He gives amazing notes. He's been so instrumental in not only giving notes on the music and lyrics, but the dramaturgy. Mm. Because like you, he's also a fan. Well, not only that, but you need... an X amount of eyes and you need to figure out what that number is because sometimes it's too little and sometimes too it's many too many cooks many, but too right many. so I'm giving X but you need other eyes yes. on the piece I think there are some people in this industry and that's fine to each his own who might get a little precious 
who try to keep that maybe a little too small. Yeah, but when it's too small, it doesn't work. Well, because then you have, as you know, you have no one at 30,000 feet. Exactly. Now, you know, for a project like White Rose, I'm not the writer. I could be at 30,000 feet for most of it. The dramaturgy, I'll have to get it at 10,000. Right. But for something like Figaro, I'm very much entrenched as an author. Right, because you're director and author. Correct. Which actually, I think, gives you a stronger piece into that. I find when people direct and also have written something, it's stronger because they have more control. It is. And you know, you're going to get people that think one way or another. You know, forget what people thought of him as a human. I'm sure stories, you know, were. I never got to work with him. Who, Merrick? No, um, Arthur Lawrence. You know, Arthur. From, yeah, but look at what he well, put on. When I look, my favorite musical of all time is Gypsy. I love. I think it's. Best a, orchestration ever. Best orchestration in the way, and dare I even say, for Arthur as the book writer, the way he orchestrated yeah. that book to almost be incidental music in this rhapsody. That book is within an inch of its life. When it went into those Stephen Sondheim lyrics, it was a baton passing, and you didn't even know where speaking and singing begun. And it's Arthur that was my North Star for Figaro. Well, I'm praying that the. Gypsy with Audrey McDonald is coming oh, because sorry. don't you think that's brilliant? Um, I, I want to see it. I saw her sing those at the Pops at the Carnegie Hall. Oh, yeah, I was there. She amazing. Well, I was like, somebody, somebody needs to do a production now because this is a show that I think works. Absolutely. And I don't know how much time we have, but because there was the chitlin. That's like wrap it up. <laughs> I, want to, I want to mention one person who's been such yeah. a big champion of mine from day one. When I graduated college, I was very fortunate to be Lonnie Price's assistant oh. on 110 in the Shade, starring oh. Audra McDonald. I love Lonnie. Lon I, I've known Lonnie since Barnum. What a mensch. A mensch and a beautiful human and a North Star for me. But to be in there in that rehearsal room and watching Audra work, it reminded me of how important it is to one day when I was going to become a director, there I was 22, watching Lonnie as a former performer have this sensitivity mm. with Audra and the actors. It was it was a really beautiful. I I, I owe a lot of experience. Uh, you know, you mentioned Audra. It reminds me of my time learning from Lonnie. Because I saw that and I was blown away, and I'm like, is nobody seeing what I'm seeing I here? I love that. because there was the Chitlin Circuit. Yeah. So it makes total sense. Like, it makes sense historically. It makes his sense every way you look at it. I that. agree. Um, when does the White Rose album come out? Great question. We are looking at the third or fourth week in April, maybe first week of May. We have two singles coming out within the next week, week and a half that will be streaming. Um, and this Smart. Trying, you know, are you doing a YouTube for it? Probably. Smart. And also because I love the show so much, I've come on as a producer with two-time Grammy and Tony winner Charlie Rosen, who I learned so much from I in the process. Charlie. I love, he's the best. And everyone, uh, Michael Croyder, everyone at Yellow Sound Label, Van Dean, um, but also Robbie Rizal, but also I have to give a special shout out. Jeff Laurianatis, one of our lead producers at White Rose, mm. came on board as the executive producer of this album. It's because of that man, because of that man, when he saw it, came to opening night, and he said, we need an album, and he just made it happen. And Figaro, when do, that's already out, right? The album is out. The because world we premiere, wrote about this. <laughs> the world premiere recording is out. It's on all platforms. And uh, announcement soon regarding specifics about London. I'm so looking forward to it. I love talking to you, as you well know. <laughs> I know. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being